Welcome to Casual Friday. I got things to discuss today, quite a few of them, so I'll put direct links down in the description and you can jump around to wherever you want in the video if you like. So the first thing I want to show you is this gadget I got at the retreat a couple of weeks ago. I forgot to mention it last week. There's no brand name on this. I didn't buy any yarn at the retreat, but I saw these little neck lights and I looked up on Amazon. There's a bunch of companies that make these. They cost about 10 bucks. They're not like made to last for, for decades, but it's a neck light that you can, you put around your neck and you can aim these in different directions. So each one of these has two lights. You can have one or the other light on or both of them on on each side. So there's, you know, a bunch of different combinations. And then you can, so if you're like driving in the car or you're somewhere where the light's not good, you could aim this at your knitting and use it. I've tried it a few times. Uh, I have pretty good light in my office, so I haven't needed it yet, but I am interested in trying it out more. I'm going to go to another retreat this weekend for the Weavers Guild and I'm going to try it out. I'm going to take it with me and see if I need it or not and, and see what I think of it. But I'd be curious to, to find out if any of you have uh, one of these kinds of neck lights and whether or not you get good use out of it and what you think of it. So I have an article in the new issue of Interweave Knitwear. It's on newsstands now. It's on finessing the three needle bind off. I did a video on this um, probably six months ago and then I wrote an article for Interweave on it. If you'd like to read the article, um, Interweave does put my articles on their blog and I'll put a link down in the description to, I have a a pages tab in my Ravelry group where you can read, where you can click on, you can see all of my interweave articles and with links to them. This is a great magazine. Uh, I was looking through the other day because I got my copy ahead of time and there's some really great uh, sweater patterns in here. <laughs> so I was sending a cop, uh, pictures of a few of them to my daughters to see uh, if they're interested and one of them for sure um, really likes one of these patterns a lot. There's a, quite a few designs by Nora Gone in it. So, so that's this, this uh, it, current issue of knit wear. I had started a blanket, a baby blanket, at the knitting retreat a few weeks ago and the two colors I was using were not working well when I was alternating them every couple of rows. They just didn't help each other. They, they go well together. It just wasn't, there wasn't enough contrast. So I rethought how I want to do this blanket and I decided to do it in sections. The, my niece's theme for the nursery, it's a sport going to be for my grand nephew, is Winnie the Pooh. So I picked colors that I thought were sort of Winnie the Poohish, kind of a caramel color and then a, a dark red color. And instead of alternating them, I decided to do a couple of sections. So two, two shorter sections of the caramel and then the middle half will be the red color. So it's sort of like the shirt that Winnie the Pooh wears and kind of dividing it out that way. So to suggest Winnie the Pooh. The stitch pattern that I had been using and that I've used in the past few blankets have come from the book sequence knitting. So I've mentioned this book before that um, that I'm using. It's called Sequence Knitting. It's a big book. It's it's heavy and it will lie flat when when it's open. So it's meant this book is designed to last and it's essentially a, a big stitch dictionary combined with the concepts for how to use sequences and conceptually sequences are not difficult to understand once the different types of sequences are pointed out to you. But it's nice to be able to see sequences that somebody have, has already come up with and then you can see how they look in the knitted fabric. Knits and pearls have an effect on each other in fabric that you can't always predict exactly when you see it on paper. So that's what I like about this book is I can look through and go, oh, you know what? I like that look. I like that look. I like that look. So I decided to use a different sequence than what I had been using. And it's a, a sequence of six stitches. It's basically knit three, purl one, knit one, purl one. But 
I'm using a instead of using a multiple of six stitches, I'm using a multiple of six stitches plus one, and I'm starting the row with a knit two. So really it's knit two, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, and then you start over with the knit two. So you still get the knit three together in most of the sequences, but at the very beginning of the row, you have a knit two, and because you have one extra stitch, more than a multiple of six, you'll end the row with knit two. So it'll be perfectly symmetrical. These designs can be fairly subtle depending on how the light hits the fabric. We'll see if you can even see what's going on. So you can kind of see I have these columns, these columns of three stitches of garter, and then you have a column of three stitches of seed stitch. And it's what's nice about the sequences is that they're easy to remember but they're not boring. So it's a very simple, I don't have to refer to a pattern constantly. I know exactly how every row is going to be worked, but I'm not bored. Like if I'm only working knit stitches constantly back and forth in garter stitch, that is so boring to me, I can't stand it. But this, not so bad. And especially since out of the six stitches, four of them are knits, so you're not purling that often if that's something that you don't enjoy doing. So anyway, that's what I've decided to do with the blanket and I'll keep you updated as things progress. So the second project update I have is the sweater I've been working on for my daughter. I have the fronts and the backs complete and I've put the neck band on. So it took me, it took me at least three, it may have been four, but I, I it for three for sure tries to get the neck right. And that's because of the number of stitches that uh, were required to be picked up combined with the fact that I wanted to line up the, the neck in front with the center of uh, the stitch pattern. So I wanted those ribs that were coming up the front of the sweater to continue up into the neck, at least for the, the, for the very center of the neck. I didn't want it to be offset. And when I picked up, usually what I do is I, I pick up however many stitches I think is the right number in terms of on a horizontal, I pick up one stitch for every existing stitch. And then on a vertical, like I had in the front of the neck and a little bit in the back, I will pick up based on the, the row to stitch gauge ratio. So in this case, I have quite a lot of uh, rows per inch. And so I was picking up one stitch for every two rows. Well, I ended up with 116 stitches on the needle and I needed 88. Now this is something I do pretty frequently because then I, I know that I'm not going to have gaps between where I'm picking up stitches and I can decrease the extras out in that first round. But I needed to, to decrease out the correct number while also making sure that I was lining up the pattern correctly in the front. I, I needed to make sure that I knew what stitch to start with, a knit or a purl, and then I needed to, to know how many to decrease and then end up at the right spot in the, in the front center and then continue and do the same thing for the back. So my first problem was just trying to mentally calculate, oh, I need to reduce one stitch of, out of every three, except for in the front where I'm gonna line things up. And I did that and, it, and things weren't working out. So then I did a spreadsheet where I kind of, I used the grid. It's, you could do this in graph paper. I, I used the grid so I knew how many stitches I'd, I had uh, picked up on the horizontal, how many I'd picked up along each side, where the seam lines were at the shoulders. And then I determined um, what stitches had to be knits and which had to be purls in the very front and back of the sweater. And then I kind of worked my way to the sides and made sure that things matched. So I did that and I got all the way around and I realized I had the wrong ratio for decreasing. I only had 78 stitches by the time I got done. So I had to undo it all and then re then I had to make sure that I actually had the right number of knits and purls. So after that third or fourth time of going through this, then uh, I got the neck uh, completely in pattern, except I noticed that on the third round, between the end of the round and the start of the round, I had three knits and I, it was a knit two, purl two pattern and I had uh, three consecutive knits and I was not going to rip it out again. So I just did a knit two together and I decided no one's ever going to notice. So, <laughs> cause I, I, couldn't do it a, I couldn't do it a fourth time.
I still don't have an exact date when this is going to go live, but I'll keep you posted. It should be sometime in the next couple of weeks. And since this isn't really a knit along that's going to have a, an end date, it, it's not really crucial that I have an exact starting date yet, at least not in my mind. But I do want to tell you a little bit more about it. So you're going to have a choice of three yarn weights. You can use worsted weight, Aran weight, or bulky weight. You will have a choice of knitting a scarf, so a long flat scarf, however long you want it, or an infinity scarf, so a scarf that will be attached. And again, you will have a choice if you, how long you want to make that. And the third option will be a cowl, which would be something that will be like maybe 24 inches, but quite, quite a bit wider. So something that you could pull over your head and would just be right up against your face um, when you're wearing it outside. The needles that you're going to need are going to be significantly larger than what you would normally use when knitting with that yarn weight. So if you were normally going to use a size seven or eight needle with worsted weight yarn, you're going to instead use a size 10. So you're going to go up um, several needle sizes in order to work the main stitch pattern. If you're working a plain flat scarf, you will also need the needle sizes that you would normally use for that yarn weight. So it, again, if it was worsted weight yarn, you might use an eight plus a size 10 needle. If you are use, if you're going to be doing an infinity scarf or a cowl, you only need the larger needle size. So for the scarf, you'll have some choices for casting on and binding off, whether you want to make the edges match as much as possible, or if you don't care so much and would rather go for simplicity. For the cowl and infinity scarf, you'll be grafting in pattern, but not with live stitches. I'll also explain how to fix mistakes that would be common to this pattern. And I will also show you how you can adjust the pattern. So if you want it to make it wider or narrower by mixing and matching the stitch patterns that are used in, in, the, in the scarf pattern. So in the next couple of weeks, for sure, we'll be going live and I'll update you each week as we go. I just wanna make sure all the videos are in place before we get started. So when I first posed the question to you guys about what you would like to see in, in a knit along, like last month. This is one of the comments I got. I'm gonna read it to you so I get it right. There is a free pattern here on Ravelry, embossed turtle cloth by S. Marie K. I've knit it several times, trying to find out which stitches create the magic of a 3D creature emerging from a flat background. The background doesn't bulge or squish around the turtle. If you would offer a set of videos that teach the techniques for how to create your own such magical being or whatever, it would be great for me at least. A knit along of an object you designed in this mode would be a nice venue for practicing these techniques. By the way, I looked everywhere I knew to learn this and I couldn't find anything. There is a pattern on Ravelry for making a little swarm of the turtles crawling onto a blanket. Still the same turtle though, thanks. So at first I couldn't quite picture what she was talking about with this creature emerging from the background of the knitted fabric. And by the time I saw her, her comment or suggestion, there had been several replies from other Ravelers already. One of them included a link to the pattern that she was talking about. And my first reaction when I saw that was, oh, it's probably related to closed cables and embossed leaf patterns. It probably uses the techniques um, that those use to create something that's raised above the surface of the knitted fabric. So I went and I took an, an actual look at the instructions and what I saw was that they were written out. And so then I knew it was gonna be a little bit more of a challenge um, to figure out whether my assumption was true or not. And uh, the clue I was looking for was were some of the rows, did some of the rows have more stitches in them than others, indicating that there had been increases without compensating decreases and were there decreases without compensating increases in other locations. And unfortunately, the way the pattern was written out, there were no stitch counts at the end of any of the rows. So I had to actually look row by row and see if I could find where there were increases and, and count them up and compare them to the decreases. And what I found was, yes, there were some rows that had um, more increases than decreases and other rows that had more decreases than increases. Now I'll get, to, I'll get to what all of this means in a little bit, 
But what I also saw in this pattern was that this is not the original source for this turtle. The original source, as was mentioned in this embossed turtle cloth pattern, was Barbara Walker's Charted Knitting Designs, a third treasury of knitting patterns. Now this was not a treasury that I owned. It's one I had heard of, but it's not one that I owned. I have the first two treasuries. Those are the two that you often hear people recommending. She, she has, I think, four treasuries plus a book on mosaic knitting, and then she's got other books that she's written as well. Um, but I had the first two treasuries, and those are all written out. The assumption is that you are knitting flat, and, and they're written instructions. But this is a book of charted designs. So as I mentioned, I knew years ago that she had four treasuries and I had this vague memory that one of them was charted designs, but I'd never looked into them at all. When I saw that, I thought, well, first of all, I'd like to see the chart because the chart would inform me uh, more about how this particular turtle worked for sure. And because otherwise I wouldn't know without knitting it and going through all those written instructions and actually knitting it up or recharting it based on the written instructions. And I really didn't want to do that, do that either. So I ordered the book. And one of the reasons I ordered the book is because I wondered how this particular book could still be relevant today. It was written in the 1970s. And what I know now about charting patterns um, is a lot more than I knew when I came back to knitting in 2005 and was first uh, buying um, stitch dictionaries and reference books and things like that. 2005 is when I first used charted knitting patterns that weren't for color work. I may have in the past used them for lace, but I, but I didn't do much lace, so I, I really am not sure. It was that year that I signed up for Janet Zabo's Follow the Leader Erin Knit Along, and she had created a set of cables that were gonna to work together for this sweater pattern, and then we were gonna decide, are we doing a cardigan pullover, how what kind of neckline we wanted and all that. But she had picked out all the cable patterns and had charted them out and included written instructions as well. And it was that, but it was those charts that I used to actually learn how to read cable charts. And then later, like a few months later, I bought another one of her patterns. It was for an, an it was for an Erin Afghan and it had multiple, uh, maybe 20 different squares. And you, so you do 20 different squares that each had either a different filler stitch or different cable pattern. And so then I really got exposed to a lot of different symbols for cable patterns. And it really understood how, how to read a cable pattern and, and make it, uh, a pretty good educated guess about how that cable would be worked without having to look at the key. I mean, I would confirm with the key, but I, it, there was some real logic behind those cable symbols. At the same time, I was starting to design my own things and really liked charts. The problem was using downloadable knitting fonts only got you so far. In order to create a symbol for a cable, you had to do a whole bunch of key sequences. And since cable span multiple stitches, it was a, it could be a challenge to try to create a chart where things were lined up and you had a cable symbol. And the cable symbols did not look like the symbols that Janet Zabo was using. She was creating those symbols in like Adobe Illustrator or something like that. So she wasn't using a knitting font in order to create these cable symbols that were so easy to read. At that time, in the early 2000s, there were sometimes you'd get a pattern with cable symbols in it that were pretty easy to read, ones that were like the ones that Janet Zabel used. And then you'd get these ones that were created using, you know, key, ASCII keyboard symbols that were trying to create something that sort of looked like a cable, but I found very difficult to read. There, there weren't charting applications yet that just had a menu full of, of knitting symbols that you can choose from, like, like today, like I used uh, Stitch Mastery's knitting chart editor. I just pick, I want a six stitch cable. Okay, here I want to use this one. This is one's got three stitches crossing three stitches, or this one has three knit stitches crossing three purl stitches. You have every sort of possibility and you don't have to create them manually. So knowing that that's what the state of charting was like in the early 2000s, I wondered 
what Barbara Walker was doing in the 1970s when she likely wasn't even using a computer and certainly wouldn't have had something like Adobe Illustrator av available to her, but would have been using a typewriter and had only the keyboard on her typewriter. Like, how could she have created charts and what did they look like? And so therefore, why was this book still relevant. I, so, I, so I ordered the book and then I waited for it. But I want to explain why I made this assumption about this turtle pattern and what I meant by saying it's probably related to closed cables or embossed leaf designs. So let me show you a few things. So this is what I mean by an embossed leaf design. So this is, this is something where you can see it's kind of three-dimensional. The, the leaves are sitting on the surface of the pearl background. And these are examples of closed cables. You see how you have this background of pearl stitches and then all of a sudden the cables just begin. So these uh, cable patterns are adapted from Elizabeth Lavold's uh, books on Viking knits. And that was the first place I'd ever seen a closed cable. Then I found in, in some of Alice Starmer books that she also had some closed cables, but her closed cables were a little bit different. Elizabeth Lavold's cables sort of gradually start, they're kind of elongated starts and finishes, where out the ones in Alice Starmore's books just began immediately. Like they, the, the cables just began and the, the, the ropes of the cables just went out from each other. So to understand how closed cables work, it's really helpful to understand sort of step by step how knits and pearls interact with each other in fabric. I touched on this earlier when I was mentioning sequence knitting that you can plan a design with knits and pearls um, juxtaposed together on fabric. And then when you knit it, it doesn't always work out the way you imagine. And so sometimes you really have to knit something to see what's really going to happen um, when the, the yarn interacts with knits and purl stitches. So one of the things that you know is like if, if, you, if you were to knit a, a square of stockinette fabric, both sides of the fabric are flat. One side has the, is the bumpy side, I mean you see the purl bumps, and the other side is where you see the V's of the stockinette stitches, but it's a flat fabric. But if you alternate knits and purls, columns of knits and purls across the fabric, you get ribbing. And that ribbed fabric is going to pull in. It's going to get narrower. The purls are going to recede and the knits are going to come forward. So that causes a thicker fabric than just the stockinette. So already you see that the knits are rising above the purls when you have columns of stitches. But if you work horizontally, it's the opposite. So if you work in garter stitch, which is a row of knits on top of a row of purls on top of a row of knits, if you're working flat, you're knitting every row, but half of the rows you're knitting on the back side of the fabric. So with respect to one side of the fabric, you have a row of knits and a row of pearls and a row of knits and a row of pearls. When you do that, you get those ridges. You get those garter ridges and that's the purl stitches coming forward and the knits are receding. So when you're working horizontally, the knits and pearls react with each other in the complete opposite of how they interact with each other when they're vertical. That's why if you've ever tried to design something like um, a dishcloth pattern where you're like, oh, I'm going to put a heart or I'm going to put a, a whatever design in reverse stockinette on a background of, of stockinette and I'll have this design and it sort of works but doesn't really, like if you have vertical bits, all of a sudden those parts disappear. And that's because of the way knits and pearls interact horizontally versus vertically. And typically what you have to do to get one of those kind of designs to appear on stockinette fabric is to work them in garter stitch because that will separate stitches by a row as they go up upwards and if they're all connected on the horizontal they actually will come forward because that's like a ridge of garter stitch. Cables are basically a variation on ribbing. So if you have a, a wide column of knits and then some narrow columns of pearls you still have those vertical columns but the fabric gets pulled in even more 
because you have stitches crossing other stitches. So that causes the fabric to narrow even more. Then you can have traveling cables and those tend to be cables where you have this background of purl stitches and then you have these ropes that are typically two knit stitches wide. Sometimes they're three, but usually they're two stitches and you'll have a bunch of them and they'll just kind of move across the fabric and crisscross each other. And um, those are rope cables. And again, if you're going to have uh, any kind of cabled fabric, you have to account for the difference in gauge by if you want something that's the same width as it would be in stockinette, you're going to have to use a lot more stitches with cables. And uh, the number that you need will really vary based on how many crossings you have and how many stitches are involved. It's hard to predict. Usually you have to swatch. But with closed cables, things are a little different. You don't plan from the beginning that you have to have all of these extra stitches. Instead, you add the stitches when you need them. So you have this background of purl stitches, and then when you want the cable to begin, when you want the ropes to appear, you increase. And there are two ways of increasing. One is the way that Elizabeth Lavell does it, which is she creates two new stitches between two existing stitches. She'll do that, and then on the next right side row, so a couple of rows later, she'll increase two more stitches, and then she'll have the four stitches she needs for her ropes, and then they can start moving away from each other. So she takes a few rows in order to, to build herself up to enough stitches to have two ropes. And then she does something similar when she's ending them. She'll eliminate two of the four stitches on a right side row and then on the wrong side row that's right after that she'll eliminate the rest of them. So you have this slow start and slow end to these closed cables. But the ones that you see in the Alice Starmore patterns create are created all at once and they're created within a stitch. So you have an existing purl stitch and you do one of these things where you're doing knit front backs or knit yarn overs or, or something like that where you're creating a bunch of stitches out of one. So it's the difference between creating a make one between two stitches and doing a knit front back where you're doing it in a stitch. That's the kind of difference. With, the, with those other kinds of closed cables, you create all the stitches you need right at once and then they can move apart. And then as you end the cable, you have that center stitch, that original stitch, and you have all the extra stitches on either side and you pass them over that center stitch, one from each side until they've all been eliminated and they're all kind of stacked on each other and all facing each other. And then the cable has ended. So you increase when you need the cables and you decrease when you don't. And because they're knit stitches, they're rising uh, above the, the surface of the reverse stockinette fabric. Now, these two different processes, they're related. They're, they're essentially the same. You're increasing the number of stitches that you need in order to create the ropes. But it's a little tricky to just you apply one of the techniques to the other cables. Like if you if you really like the the technique that where they all start at once and you want to apply that to one of Elizabeth Lavold's patterns, a little trickier because they're centered differently. One of them is centered on a on, on a centered stitch and one is centered between stitches. And so as you're moving apart from each other, you have a different number of stitches between the ropes. So it can take a little bit more thinking through things if you want to translate one of uh, the patterns that you see in that are originally done one style to a pattern that's done in the other style. So as we see this progression of techniques and how we use knits and purls together and how we use cables and how we use um, more stitches in order to accommodate cables, but we can do it in a different way for closed cables than we do for starting right at the edge with cables. So my copy of Barbara Walker's book arrives and I look in the index for the turtle. And where do I find the turtle? I find it at the end of a chapter on closed cables. So that can, and I could then see the chart and I could confirm, confirm that I was correct that this turtle is related to closed cables, but it's occurring at the very end of this chapter. It's it's the most complex example of a closed cable or the use of closed cable technique. I looked at that, then I started flipping through the book. I couldn't believe the charts. They were the kind of charts that I'm used to seeing in contemporary cable patterns, the kind of charts that 
that I can create when I use my charting software. The kind of charts very similar to the ones that Janet Zabo was using, um, but was creating in her Adobe Illustrator. And I, I, was, I was really stunned by that. So I started at the beginning of the book and I read the introductory information. And what I discovered was that while the first two treasuries were really collections of traditional patterns, uh, patterns that, that existed previously, that she was just bringing them all into one place. She, Barbara Walker mentions at the beginning of this book that there were a few stitch patterns that were her creation in her first two treasuries, but most of them were existing patterns. But this book contains mostly stitch patterns that, of her creation. And she mentions that in English and American uh, knitting patterns, we were in the 1970s, we were mostly using written instructions, um, unlike the Europeans, which were more likely to use charted designs. So she had looked at their charted patterns and she'd used a few of the symbols that she had seen in those. But then she sat down with graph paper and pencil and figured out how to chart things like cables. And the way she figured it out is the way that we use them today. So she didn't have to worry about whether or not her computer had a font that could represent different knitting stitches because she was using graph paper and pencil. These are all hand-drawn charts in this book. It's amazing. <laughs> so that's why this book is still relevant. It's still relevant because it is the foundation for how we are charting knitting patterns today. It's not, it didn't become irrelevant because of knitting fonts. It maintained its relevance until the computer technology could catch up to what she had figured out 40 years ago. And, um, and now we can just click on our choices and, um, and create our own, our own knitting charts. At the beginning of the, the chapter on closed cables, she indicates that this is a new type of of design, a new concept. So she created the whole concept of closed cables. So while I had seen them first in Elizabeth Lavell's book and then realized that Alice Starmore had them in her books and that they were using two different types of things, it was Barbara Walker who figured out how to do closed cables. So one of the things that I've always loved about Barbara Walker and her stitch dictionaries is that her first treasury has all of the foundations of different types of stitch patterns. So if you have never seen a cable before, it has the most basic rope cable in it, in addition to a bunch of other types of cables. If you want to learn lace, it has the most basic lace patterns in there, including the all the different variations on what it's, what's called fagoting, which is just alternating a decrease with the yarn over all the way across to create mesh fabric. She has every basic in that first treasury, in addition to a bunch of other things. And then the second treasury, is just an amazing collection of really cool stitch patterns. And in that second, I think it's the second treasury, is where she has a chapter on mosaic knitting, which is what she invented. <laughs> she invented mosaic knitting, and then she wrote an entire book on mosaic knitting. So this third treasury continues her innovation. So she she figured out a way to present charts that makes a lot of sense. She created closed cables. She, she did all of these innovative things in this book and uh, it's still relevant today. And I'm, I'm just completely, <laughs> completely in awe of this woman. I just realized I haven't shown you the turtle. So this, this is the turtle. Can you see him? Can you see the turtle? You see him here? And you see how high off the surface he's coming? It's, it's really amazing. It's way higher off the surface than just a cable would be or an embossed leaf pattern. So this turtle is unique in a few ways. One, this turtle is way wider than any cable would be. It's and way wider than an embossed leaf pattern would be. She also didn't use just stockinette to create the shell of the turtle. She used ribbing. And I think that's probably for design purposes in terms of visual design, but also in terms of providing more structure to the fabric because the, 
the ribbing would be uh, thicker from the, the knits and the pearls receding and coming toward each other. You create that thicker fabric that's probably going to create more stability as well. So again, this is the most advanced use of this particular technique. And I'm not really sure what other sorts of creatures would work in this sort of situation. Like a turtle is a fairly horizontal creature and is something that you see crawling along the ground. So it makes sense in this particular context. So while I think this turtle is an amazing feat of knitting architecture, I'm not sure how would I, would, I would ever use it, like what kind of project I would want to use something in, and I'm not even sure what other kinds of creatures would work. It's, it could be my lack of imagination, but you know, I'm trying to think of what creatures are sort of horizontal enough that you could get this overhead view of them and side view of them that would look realistic. But if this is something that you're interested in, I think understanding that progression of how knits and pearls interact with each other on the surface, how cables work, how closed cables work, how you use increases to create the additional stitches that you want that won't affect the width of the fabric. All of that together combined with what she did specifically in this particular stitch pattern to create that turtle might help you design something similar to that, just building on those concepts. So I'm not going to be doing a knit along on this. I'm, I can't even come up with another animal that I think would, would work in this situation. Uh, and I'm not particularly motivated to spend a lot of time doing it, but I think it's really an interesting learning opportunity if it's something that you might be interested in. And once you understand that sort of progression of how knits and pearls work together on the surface of the fabric, how closed cables work, and, and then seeing what Barbara Walker did to create this turtle, once you understand that sort of progression and what, what causes um, the fabric to be able to work in a three-dimensional way, then that's the first step toward designing your own creatures. And I would be really interested to see if any of you come up with something uh, unique based on um, what Barbara Walker um, established here in her third treasury. So that's it for this week. If you like my videos, you can support me by buying me a coffee on Ko-fi. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.